much. All right. I'll begin by reading the texts for today. Uh, they're coming from Genesis 131 and Colossians 116. Hear the word of God. Genesis 131. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. And Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Amen. All right. Well, once again, it's good to be here. Good to see you guys. And I'd like to say Happy New Year once again. Uh, what, what year is this? Is this the year of the rabbits? Right? How many rabbits do we have here? All right. All right. Good, good, good. So how was your uh, New Year's? What did you guys do? Nothing. Okay, okay. We got one nothing. Fireworks. What's that? Okay, so family gatherings, right? Making food. Can anyone hear me? Yes. What's I can't hear you. Hot pot. Okay, hot pot's good. Good stuff. Um, what are some of the common things that people do and on New Year's? Yes. A lot of fireworks, yes. Yes. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you guys. Okay. The, the thing that I'm trying to get to is people usually like to make New Year's resolutions, correct? Yeah? Have you guys made any New Year's resolutions? Well, good. I hope you guys are keeping them. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, quiet down, please. Quiet down. Okay, so one of the resolutions of this church seems like we'll be reading and studying the New City Catechism, one question and answer per week, right? So today we're at number five, which you read together. So I invite you to recite catechism together one more time, and then I'll read our passage again, all right? Number five, what else did God create? God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. And with that in mind, let me read our passage one more time, okay? Genesis 131. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Amen. Let's all pray before we start. Creator God, we are gathered here today to worship you. Thank you for sustaining all of us in your grace always, and also for bringing us to your house of worship today. Cause our distracted hearts and busy minds to quiet down and focus upon your word so that through this time of worship, we will be able to glorify you the way you deserve to be glorified with our undivided and sincere heart of worship. We also ask that you'd give us wisdom, clarity, and spiritual maturity. And as I bring the message to this congregation in reverence, help me exposit your word in purity and clarity as well. Thank you, God. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. All right. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, one more, one more. Yeah, there we go, New City Catechism. Okay, so the question, what else did God create? What does that tell you? The previous question, God created something, and then we're learning what else God created, right? So this is a question that is building off of the previous question. And the previous question was, do you guys remember what it was? 
Next, next slide, please. Oh, next one. There we go. There's uh, question four there. How and why did God create us? Have you guys been uh, memorizing the catechisms at all? All right, then we'll uh, do check on learning. Question number four, how and why did God create us? God created us, male and female, in his own image, to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is a right that, and it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. Okay, so based on these two sets of questions and answers, uh, we establish the fact that God is a creator of us and everything else. And when I say everything, I mean everything, right? Uh, next slide, please. Literally everything. So what is everything? Not just the things of this world, but also the things that are not of this world. Things that are seen and unseen. Things that are tangible and intangible. Things that we can understand and the things that we don't even have any knowledge of. And similarly, if you will look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, next slide. It also talks about creation in chapter 4, article 1. Let me read it for you guys. It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. Next slide, please. So these examples, along with many other historical orthodox confessions that affirm God's work of creation, are not just some statements that were created in order to justify our traditions or ridiculous belief system, right? But rather, they are succinct confessions. So what are confessions? The summary of what we believe because the scripture attests to it clearly and leaves us with no other possibility of understanding it otherwise. Therefore, we must remember that we don't derive authority of the Bible from these confessions, but it's the other way around. These confessions and catechisms have authority because they are derived from the authority of the Bible, correct? So when we look at these catechisms and have anything that is unclear to us, what can we do? We can go back to the scripture, right? We can go back to the scripture and get some clarifications. So having said that, we're going to um, exposit Genesis 131 and Colossians 116 together. But let's first take a look at Genesis 131. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. All right, we're going to be focusing on the first half of that verse. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So what more can we know from this verse that wasn't clearly, or it seems like that wasn't clearly communicated in the catechism? So not only do we affirm that God is a creator of everything, but we also learn that he made everything very good, right? So at this point, next slide please, you might be wondering why evil if there is God and if God created everything very good. So you might be tempted to reject God and your belief in him based on those two words, very good, which seemingly contradict the state of the world today. Would you agree? But I would like to encourage you not to uh, be discouraged. So don't let those two seemingly contradicting words be a stumbling block for you. So do you ever feel like you're losing faith in God because you are discouraged by all the bad things you see 
that's going on around in the world? What might those be? Accidents, disasters, diseases, wars, poverty, hate. Sometimes you see them in the news, but oftentimes you experience them in your immediate circle of life, right? So when you see those things, do you want to ask that question, if God existed, how could all these bad things happen all the time? So to that, allow me to tell you a couple things. One, you're not the only one who sees it. Everyone else sees it too. And two, more importantly, before you hastily reject God's work of creation or the very existence of him in the first place, you must understand that the state of our current world today is not the same as the state of the world immediately after God created it. So God did, in fact, make everything very good. And everything was made very good in order to reflect the goodness and glory of the creator God. Furthermore, we were created to be as image bearers, right? And we were supposed to live in the perfect peace, joy, and comfort in the ultimate Sabbath, forever worshiping and glorifying God our Father in the Garden of Eden. So why all the bad things? Next slide, please. As sin entered the world through one man, who is that one man? Adam, that's right. God's perfect creation was tainted and distorted, and we now inherit Adam's sinful nature. That is why this world we live in can seem like it's not a very good place. And it's all because, as uh, Romans 6.23 says, sin brought in death, for the wages, wages of sin is death. And Genesis 3.18 says, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. This caused the world to start bringing thorns and thistles, literally and figuratively. And that is causing us to know God deep down in our hearts, but our natural tendency is to reject him. Next slide, please. So while we live in this broken reality, it can seem like our lives uh, filled with hardships with no hope in sight. We live in the fear of anticipation of a painful death one day. We constantly ask, our, ask ourselves the meaning of life, and we speculate what lies ahead after we die. And most importantly, our sinful nature that we inherited from Adam causes us to dilute and distort the knowledge of God with skepticism and doubt. And that's called the uh, noetic effects of sin, if you want to look up the technical terms, right? And that is why, can you hear me? Okay. And that is why, without the grace of God that calls us to him, we are futile in our hearts and disposition toward God. Next slide, please. But even without the explicit knowledge of God, our world still never ceases to testify God's existence, goodness, and glory. So when you just look around the world and ponder all the things, all the inner workings of how everything functions and exists, including those of nature and even our own bodies, our world ceaselessly proclaims the glory of God. That's why the psalmist, King David, said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Next slide, please. And to that, the Apostle Paul further, further explained in Romans 1.20, 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are left without excuse. Next slide, please. So both King David and the Apostle Paul are saying that everything we see that causes us to go, wow, this is amazing, this is pretty cool, is a revelation of God's attributes. So it is impossible to look at this world and be convinced that all of this happened by chance. To believe that the majesty of this world is manifested for the sake of just being manifested is not the conclusion you should reach. Next slide. <clears throat> so everything that is displaying the remnants of the lost perfect world, the very good things that God created, points to our creator God. That is the only reasonable and rational conclusion we ought to reach. Therefore, even in this fallen and broken world, where it seems like nothing's going right, despite our sinful nature, we are left without excuse as to why we couldn't believe in God despite all that is clearly perceived as God's revelation. And you need to remember that this world is temporary, and one day in glory, we'll see our God, our creator God, face to face, and all of God's invisible attributes that we can never fully comprehend in our minds in this world will be clearly manifested in heaven and we'll forever rejoice and worship God there together. But that does not mean that we are neglected in this world, left to wonder what God is like. On the contrary, we are given Jesus Christ, the preeminent God who took upon our likeness in order to be slain so that he could take away our sins and reverse the curse of death once for all. This Jesus is very clearly proclaimed in our second passage, Colossians 1.16. Uh, but let me read uh, the four verses, Colossians 15 through 18. Okay, listen up, everyone. Colossians 1, 15 to 18. He is the image of invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Amen. So who is this he that the passage is talking about? Who is this he? It's Jesus, right? So before we unpack this passage verse by verse, let's briefly talk about uh, the purpose and context of this passage, why it was written, who wrote it. So this passage is from the book of Colossians, which is a letter written by Paul to the Colossian church. Hey, who did I say was written by? And who was it written to? Good. All right. It was a letter written by Paul to the Colossian church when he had heard that there were some people who started teaching strange doctrines, causing many Colossians to fall for the heresies. So in order to warn the church against the heresies, Paul wrote this letter, and this specific passage we read basically establishes the main point of the entire letter. And the main point is, that Jesus Christ is supreme over creation because he is the pre-existent God who created everything in him, through him, and for him. Therefore, we must worship him. 
Now let's see what each verse talks about. Next slide, please. Okay, in verse 15, Paul says that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. As for the image of God, the original Greek word icon can mean two things. So the original word icon can mean two things. One is likeness, a thought brought out in some of the versions. Two is manifestation, a revelation of an essence. So depending on which definition you take, the meaning of the verse can slightly differ. So if you take the first definition, it would mean that Jesus portrays the exact likeness of God in his appearance like a reflection in the mirror. If you take the second definition, the verse would mean that Jesus is an image of God in the sense that God's own nature and identity are perfectly revealed in Christ. Either interpretation results in exaltation of Christ, but I think we should not limit it to one or the other, but rather both. Because Jesus is, both in his physical appearance and in very essence, the revelation of God himself. Therefore, we can boldly proclaim, as Paul did in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, that we have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that we, as his image bearers, through Christ, are being transformed into his likeness in glory. The second part of this verse, uh, stay on 15, please. The second part of the verse, the firstborn of all creation. What do you think that means, the firstborn of all creation? Mm -hmm. What? God. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that he was the first thing to be created. No, he was never created. He always was and is and always will be, right? So the firstborn of all creation means that he was before the creation. So it emphasizes the preeminence. Preeminence means that he was always there. He was the first. And that he is above all created things. All right, now let's take a look at verse 16. Now verse 16 qualifies verse 15, how this can be. Christ is above all things and before all things because by him everything was created. The preposition by can also be translated as in. So in him everything was created. So what would that mean? He is the one who created everything. He is the creator, right? The creator of what? What is the boundary of everything? What does everything include? It says everything in heaven and on earth. So if you think about the heaven and on earth, it's the things that are above and the things that are below, the two realms that are completely the opposite of each other, which denote a stronger emphasis on the totality of his work of creation. And in the same manner, visible and invisible, those are, those are the two things that make up the entire universe, right? The world is filled with the things that you can't see and the things you can't see. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? So Jesus created all of it as well. And thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities All things were created through him and for him. So whatever supernatural or earthly notion of power or hierarchy or authority, that is also under the authority of Christ Jesus because he made them as well. Let's take a look at uh, verse 17. And in verse 17, Paul is 
summarizing the previous two verses. He is before all things, reiterates the existence of Jesus preceding everything, preceding everything we know, therefore he ranks higher than everything we know. In him, all things hold together. What do you think that means? In Jesus, everything holds together. It means that Jesus is central to the world order. Everything is created and sustained by Christ because he is the unifying principle who created everything out of nothing, the cosmos out of chaos. Therefore, Jesus is the only standard we should live by. Verse 18. Finally, verse 18 answers, so what question. Great, Jesus is the creator of everything. He is above everything. He is before everything. So what? How does that relate to you? What does it matter in your life? Because he is the preeminent, all-powerful, and supreme creator above all things, he is also the head of the church. And the word church, in its original language, Greek, is ecclesia. And ecclesia doesn't necessarily mean this, the building. It means congregation, assembly, gathering of people. So the church means that the people who make up the church, the sinners who are redeemed by the grace of Christ, therefore his sovereignty is what gives the church, us, our life. And Jesus governs it all. Think of your body. If you didn't have your head, would you be alive? No. Jesus is the life-giving principle, the head of the church. And we are the church, right? The sinners redeemed by grace, we are the church. He is a leader of all his ecclesia, now and forevermore. All right, so let me finish this up. So we... Take a look at uh, New City Catechism number five once more. And with everything that I said in mind, let's recite the New City Catechism number five one more time. What else did God create? God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. So guys, when we confess that God created all things by his powerful word and all his creation was very good, we're not just reciting a traditionally correct statement or only affirming the mere existence of God. But we're in fact professing our faith in the triune God who always was, still is, and will always be that God is sovereign and supreme over all creation, and that his immense love has redeemed us through Christ once for all. So we are assured of our hope in life and death that our souls belong to Christ, our Lord, the creator, our savior. Still, this may not change the current state of the world, but it changes your perspective. It chips away at the scales over your eyes so you can see the truth. It transforms you into the likeness of Christ more and more, and it allows you to understand that the world today is the way it is, not because God is powerless, but because God has given us undeserved grace to be redeemed, and because God has completely reversed the curse of sin through Christ, his son, our savior and creator. So instead of worrying about all the unfortunate events in the world, instead of concerning yourselves over the meaning of life, instead of being trampled by social injustice, instead of fighting the anxiety of the uncertainty of what lies ahead after our physical death, and instead of allowing the world to further distort your heart 
and make you more futile towards God, we are able to secure our hope in life everlasting because Jesus, the sovereign over all creation, has begun to bring out the new creation. And because Jesus reclaimed his lost people through his death on the cross and glorious resurrection, and because Jesus calls us to come to him so that he can give us rest, and because Jesus has completed what Adam couldn't do, living a perfectly sinless life and obeying completely to the point of death on the cross. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the preeminent creator. He calls each and every one of us to come to him, repent of our sins, lay down our burdens, and come into the ultimate Sabbath. So as you learn more about the catechisms, I pray that they will remind you of the sovereignty of God and the glory of his creation, and that you will be edified each and every day so that God alone will be glorified. Let's pray. We can start when you're ready. Dear Jesus, you are the preeminent word who created everything, and we marvel at your handiwork. Your glory and majesty are daily proclaimed by everything you have created. But we know that simple knowledge, acknowledgement of your existence isn't sufficient for our salvation. So we thank you for allowing us to hear the gospel that we may believe and receive salvation. Help us to see your creation more clearly and cause our faith to grow more and more. Pray this in your holy name. Amen.